Welcome to BATS, Basic Anatomy Training with Sonography. In this video we're going to try and develop a basic understanding of how the ultrasound technology was developed. We're also going to try and become familiar with some of the key players in the development of this imaging modality. We're going to look at the latest development of ultrasound equipment, the ones that you will be using, and we're going to try and understand some basic probe manipulation and maneuvers and actually also some of the terminology we're going to use to clearly communicate with each other. And last but not least, we're going to see if we can understand some of the basics of the anatomy of the thyroid gland and what it looks like in ultrasound. So what is ultrasound actually? Well, the human hearing range is about from 20 Hz to 20,000 Hz, where Hz is the unit of frequency. Sound waves that have a frequency lower than 20 Hz are called infrasound, and sound waves with a frequency of greater than 20,000 Hz or 20 MHz are called ultrasound waves. Ultrasound is a sound with a frequency that is greater than the upper limit of human hearing. Although the upper limit of human hearing is quite variable from person to person, in a healthy young adult it's about 20 megahertz, so 20,000 cycles per second. Diagnostic medical ultrasound has a much higher frequency than that, usually in the range of 1 to 20 megahertz, so millions of cycles per second. Hold on a moment. Whoever decided to call frequency hertz? Well, answer is pretty simple. As it is in chemistry, physics, and basically all sciences, the first discoverer or first describer, his name was Hertz. It was Heinrich Rudolf Hertz, who was actually born in the same hometown as yours truly, although quite a lot earlier. And also here is a tower, about 300 meters tall, which served as a TV tower all through the 80s, which is called the Heinrich Hertz Tower. Well, let's have a look at a few examples from the animal kingdom. There are some animals who actually do emit sound waves and listen to the returning echoes and are able to use this to locate prey or just to navigate. And we call this echolocation. For instance, bats and dolphins both use echolocation. And in the next slide, I'm going to show an animation of a dolphin on its way to hunt some small fish and how it uses sound waves to locate these fish you'll see that the sound waves are the actual sound waves produced by a dolphin underwater. In this video animation, which I borrowed from the University of South Carolina, you can see the dolphin using sound waves underwater. The sound waves get reflected off of objects or fish, and so the dolphin listens to the echoes that are returning, and this will allow the dolphin to determine what is the nature of the object or life form that is reflecting the ultrasound beams. Bats also, as you know, use echolocation to hunt prey. In this clip, a bat will hunt a moth and catch it in mid-air. The intensity and pulse repetition of the ultrasound impulses changes as the bat homes in on the moth. And it does this so that it has a much more precise location of the prey animal. Next in line is the Austrian mathematician and physicist named Christian Andreas Doppler. He was as you might expect, the discoverer of the so-called Doppler effect. Originally, it plays a major role in astronomy because it describes the change in frequency and wavelength of starlight depending on if the star you are watching is actually relatively moving away from you or towards you. As in this little pictogram here, you can see that a star moving away from you will have a redshift effect and a star moving toward you will have a relative blue shift effect. So you will have a shift in the frequency to a longer wavelength and a shorter frequency if the object is moving away and a shorter wavelength and an increased frequency in objects approaching you. In ultrasound, we can also make use of this effect by applying color Doppler, which will tell you if a fluid is moving relatively toward or away from the probe. Although the color that we apply to it is quite irrelevant, we can switch it on the push of a button. The first device that was actually used in terms of medical technology was an echoscope in 1950. John J. Wilde managed to develop this using an old Navy radar simulator and he created the first machine that would for instance allow pregnant mothers to see the first image of their unborn children. 
If you have a look at a print of Dr. Wilde's poster from 1955, you can actually see that he was a real visionary. All of the applications that you can see on his poster from so long ago are actually reality nowadays. Machines were kind of clunky in the 50s still. You can see that here in this experiment from Holmes and Howery, the entire patient had to be submerged in water. Now that we have more sophisticated machines and we have ultrasound gel, things have gotten much easier. Nowadays, if you compare the size of an ultrasound scanner back in the 60s or possibly 70s to what they look like today, you can see everything's undergoing miniaturization. And as technology advances, we are able to cram more and more technology into these little devices and make them much more powerful in what we can do with them. Let me just say a couple of things about the piezoelectric effect. Piezoelectric crystals, as they used to be used in ultrasound devices, now they've changed to a slightly different material. They have the property that they can convert electric energy into mechanical energy and vice versa. So if you squeeze them, they will produce electricity. If there's an incoming sound wave, as here, when this crystal gets squeezed, you can see that the needle on the voltmeter will actually move and you create a current. On the other hand, if you apply electricity to them, or pulse electricity, you will create sound waves. So these are called direct and indirect piezoelectric effects. So indirect is if we apply electricity to the crystal, which will then make it shrink and expand. And every time we do that, we emit a sound wave. And the direct piezoelectric effect, of course, is receiving sound waves and converting these into electricity. And whenever that happens, we can use a computer to integrate this and generate an image out of the received signal. Here are three different probes you should really be familiar with. Ultrasound probes come in many different shapes and sizes that depends on the purpose you want to use them for. A linear probe, as you can see on the far left here, uses high frequency ultrasound to create high resolution images of structures that are near the body surface. For instance, if you want to scan your wrist and your carpal tunnel or peripheral veins. So this probe is ideal for vascular imaging and certain procedures like center line placement. When you look at your ultrasound probe, you will notice that it will have a little marker. This can be either a ridge or a little knob or on modern devices, even a little LED. It's very important to track what direction this is pointing in. Most of the time, we will have the probe marker pointed towards the patient's right or cephalad or cranially, so towards the patient's head. This will be reflected in a marker on the screen. In this image of the scan of the heart, you can see the probe marker is pointing towards the patient's right. And there's a dot on the left of the screen here that indicates the position of the probe marker. If this marker was reversed, we would have a 180 degree reversed image on the screen as well. So if at any time during your scans you are confused because you are seeing a mirror image, check that probe marker. Both for the probe in your hand and what orientation it actually has on the screen as this can switch depending on the application you do. There are four main interactions of an ultrasound wave with tissue or tissue interfaces. They're going to be reflection, refraction, scattering and attenuation. I'm going to go ahead and show you four more slides with a little bit more detail about each of these four interactions. Reflection describes the phenomenon when an ultrasound beam hits a tissue interface and is reflected back to the transducer as shown in this animation here. The angle of incidence is going to be the same as the angle of reflection. To get the best possible image, you have to keep the transducer perpendicular to the object you want to image. So in that case, you would then have the maximum amount of ultrasound beams reflected back to the transducer. In the diagram here, you can see two media with different acoustic impedance values. Watch the video animation and see how the ultrasound beam changes direction suddenly as it crosses the interface into the medium with a different tissue impedance. This deviation is actually based upon the principle of Snell's law. Scattering is a phenomenon that occurs when the width of the lateral dimension of the scatterer is less than one wavelength. Scattering is actually really useful in ultrasound because scattering results in the formation of ultrasound images. Attenuation of ultrasound waves is kind of similar to attenuation when we describe other imaging modalities. It basically means that as the ultrasound wave, as you can see in the animation here, passes through a medium, it will progressively absorb some of the energy of the ultrasound wave. So the further it goes through, the less of the ultrasound wave is actually going to penetrate through the media. The ultrasound beam is attenuated in tissues at a rate of about one decibel per centimeter. Attenuation in fluid is actually much less. 
and that results in a phenomenon called postacoustic enhancement, which you can see distal to fluid-filled structures like, for instance, the urinary bladder or an ovarian cyst. Moving on to diagnostic medical sonography. This is a technique where we use ultrasound waves of a high frequency, as previously discussed, and an ultrasound transducer together with some ultrasound gel, where we can then send the sound waves through either mucous membranes or through the skin to visualize internal organs and all associated anatomical structures. The ultrasound waves are going to reflect from tissue interfaces, organs, and regions of different tissue density. And the returning echoes are going to be detected by this here, the probe, and the data generated will be then converted by the computer, the CPU, into a grayscale image for us to interpret on this screen. Let me note here, actually, it's not only grayscale. Modern ultrasound has much more than just grayscale images. This is a pretty modern machine actually displayed here. Here you can set it to color flow Doppler, where you can actually visualize the direction that fluid is moving in, and some other very fancy modern machines will even allow you to do a so-called 4D ultrasound that gives you a three-dimensional appreciation of the underlying tissues and structures. Moving on, let's have a look at some scans and some basic scanning technique. When we're discussing procedures such as peripheral nerve block technique, it is quite useful to describe terms for basic needle and probe manipulation. These have been set forth by the American Institute of Ultrasound in Medicine, or AIUM. Here I'm going to go ahead and describe scan planes, probe manipulation maneuvers, and different needle approaches. First off, if we look at a short axis view, we can see how the beam is coming out of the ultrasound transducer and hitting the structure, in this case it's a tube-like structure, like a blood vessel, in a way that it is resembled as a circle on the screen. This short axis viewing cuts the cylinder transversely to resemble a circle. If we were to turn the probe lengthwise, so a long axis, it would resemble two lines with a hollow lumen in the middle, as you can see now. Because we can rotate and manipulate an ultrasound transducer around any of its three axes in space, we need to be sure that we know how to communicate these movements to our colleagues and co-workers. Here we can see an ultrasound probe moving and pivoting along each of its x, y, and z axes. If we think about the motions we can exert with our probe, we can slide either up and down the structure or from left to right. We can also use the probe to compress the tissue and, with that, the underlying structures, as you can see in this animation. We can also rock the probe back and forth, as indicated here. And we can rotate the probe to switch from a short axis view as here into a long axis view and back into short axis. Tilting allows us to scan up and down a structure. This is especially important if you have to scan through a narrow acoustic window, like when you're doing nerve imaging. In nerve imaging, it is best if the plane of the beam is orthogonal to the nerves that you want to image. Okay, so now let's do some real scanning. We're going to be using the high frequency probe. We're going to use the GE Venue 40 system and this homemade so called ballistics gelatin phantom. What I use is, as you can imagine, ballistics gelatin. I've embedded into here, to this little block of gel, two structures. These are both Penrose drains. On the top is a half inch, and on the bottom is an eighth of an inch. Penrose drain. So with the transducer on the gel block, I'm going to start off in short axis and then turn it into long axis and then back into short axis. Turn it into long axis. 
and then back into short axis. Okay, now let's move on to the thyroid gland. I'm using Anatomy TV here to show you where it is actually. Remember you can get to this via Lister Hill Library. We do have a subscription to it. You can find your thyroid gland deep to several muscles in the neck. First we'll remove the platysma. Might as well get rid of the nerves. Same about the veins. Now we can see that it's going to be deep to the sternohyoid and the sternothyroid muscles. Approximately at the level of C5 down to T1 in the neck. Let me hide those muscles. And here we go. Sometimes the thyroid gland will actually also have one of these little things up here, which is a pyramidal lobe. It has two oval lobes, one on the right side and one on the left side, and they're connected by a thin isthmus in the middle. Usually about at the level of the third tracheal cartilage. A normal thyroid gland has lobes that are sized approximately four to six centimeters long, and the AP thickness will be about or less than two centimeters. There's something really important on the posterior aspect of the thyroid gland, which you can see shimmering through here. These are parathyroid glands. I'll hide one half of the thyroid gland. You usually have four of these parathyroid glands, superior and inferior on both the right and left side. These are very, very important because they make parathyroid hormone, without which life is not possible. Before we move on to the actual ultrasound scans, let's have a look at this image from Clinically Orientated Anatomy 7. Down here we can see a cross-sectional view or a transverse view at the level of approximately the C7 vertebrae. You can see here is the thyroid gland, here is the trachea, and if you look a little further laterally here, you can see your IJV and your common carotid artery. So if you were to place the ultrasound probe approximately here, slightly off-center of the midline of the neck, you should be able to see a lot of the thyroid lobes, either the right or the left lobe, and associated strap muscles. And if you move a little further laterally, you should have a nice view of the IJV and the common carotid artery. If you move superiorly, you should see the bifurcation of the common carotid into the internal and external carotid arteries. And note that you can also do a Valsalva maneuver and have the IJV billow up nicely. And if you press down, it should be compressible. The patient should be lying supine on the examination table. The table can be raised to a comfortable level if needed. A pillow can be placed under the shoulder to provide better access to the thyroid gland by extending the neck. A high frequency linear array probe with a range of 5 to 13 megahertz is suitable for scanning the deep vessels of the neck and the thyroid gland. Select the carotid preset on the ultrasound device. Place the probe over the area of the right common carotid artery and internal jugular vein. For the transverse view, the probe marker should be facing the patient's right. The common carotid artery will appear circular and pulsatile. Adjust the position of the probe so that the common carotid artery appears in the center of the screen. Angle the probe so that the carotid artery appears round in cross-section. The lumen of the blood vessels should appear black or anechoic. The position of the internal jugular vein is variable, but will generally appear lateral and slightly anterior to the common carotid artery. Asking the patient to do a Valsalva maneuver will help distinguish the internal jugular vein by causing it to distend. Select the thyroid preset on the ultrasound device. To obtain a transverse view of the thyroid, make sure that the probe marker is facing toward the patient's right. Place the probe on the anterior surface of the neck between the larynx and the suprasternal notch. Adjust the position of the probe so that the thyroid is in the center of the screen. Note the homogeneous echo texture of the normal thyroid gland. This image demonstrates that the thyroid gland is bordered anteriorly by the strap muscles and laterally by the carotid artery and sternocleidomastoid muscle. Posteriorly, the thyroid is bordered by the longus colli muscles. The thyroid gland is more echogenic than the adjacent muscles and blood vessels. Shift the position of the probe so that it is slightly to the right of the midline. Bring the right lobe of the thyroid to the center of the screen and obtain an optimal mid-transverse view. 
And this concludes the introduction to ultrasound. Please make sure that you also check out these resources from the University of South Carolina School of Medicine, who were also gracious enough to let me use and modify some of their material. They have quite extensive YouTube playlists. And also from SUSME, the Society of Ultrasound and Medical Education, there are some really good online learning modules that you have free access to as well. Thank you for your attention. A phased array transducer with an abdomen exam type is used to perform the right upper quadrant view of the FAST exam. The orientation marker is directed toward the patient's head. The transducer is placed in a long axis orientation along the right mid-axillary line between the 7th to 9th intercostal space. Rotation and oblique positioning of the transducer will help eliminate rib shadows. To evaluate the entire area of the hepatorenal recess for free fluid, sweep the transducer from an anterior to posterior position. If present, fluid will appear as a dark or anechoic stripe between the kidney and the liver. If it is difficult to visualize the hepatorenal recess, a deep inspiration will move the diaphragm and other structures in this area down and below the ribs for easier access. Sliding the transducer upward will visualize the diaphragm and pleural interface. Sliding the transducer downward will visualize the inferior pole of the right kidney. A phased array transducer with an abdomen exam type is used to perform the subxiphoid or subcostal view of the heart in the FAST exam. Place the transducer in the subxiphoid position with the orientation marker to the patient's right side at a 9 o'clock position. This view uses the liver as an acoustic window to visualize the four chambers of the heart. Aim the transducer slightly toward the left shoulder at a 15 degree angle to the chest wall. In some cases, the transducer is almost flat to the abdominal wall, so the ultrasound beam is directed toward the left chest cavity. A considerable amount of ultrasound gel and downward pressure may be needed to maintain contact of the transducer face with the abdominal wall. Increase scanning depth to visualize all chambers of the heart. The first structure seen closest to the transducer is the liver. The right side of the heart will appear closer to the transducer than the left side of the heart on the ultrasound image. The myocardium will appear gray and the blood-filled chambers will appear hypoechoic. The bright white pericardium is seen surrounding the heart adjacent to the gray myocardium. Evaluate the function of all chambers. Compare the size of the right and left ventricular cavities. Note any wall motion abnormality and the presence or absence of pericardial effusion. A phased array transducer with an abdomen exam type is used to perform the left upper quadrant view of the FAST exam. The orientation marker is directed toward the patient's head. The transducer is placed in a long axis orientation along the left posterior axillary line between the 5th to 7th intercostal spaces. The sonographer's hand will touch the gurney with the proper transducer position. Rotation and oblique positioning of the transducer will help eliminate rib shadows. To evaluate the entire area of the spleenorenal recess for free fluid, sweep the transducer from an anterior to posterior position. Carefully examine the spleenorenal recess and subphrenic space. Fluid will appear dark or anechoic. If it is difficult to visualize the spleenorenal recess, a deep inspiration will move the diaphragm and other structures in this area down and below the ribs for easier access. Sliding the transducer in an upward direction will visualize the diaphragm and pleural interface.
A phased array transducer with an abdomen exam type is used to perform the pelvis view of the FAST exam. Place the transducer in a transverse position with the orientation marker to the right at the level of the symphysis pubis. The pelvis is evaluated in two planes. It is easier to perform this exam when the bladder is filled. The bladder is used as an acoustic window to view the cul-de-sac or retrovesicular space for free fluid. To visualize the bladder, angle the transducer inferiorly into the pelvis. If it is difficult to visualize the bladder, slide to the left or right of the symphysis pubis to bring the bladder into view. To evaluate the pelvis for free fluid, sweep the transducer from an inferior to superior position. Fluid will appear hypoechoic or anechoic and accumulate posterior to the bladder, posterior to the uterus, and between loops of bowel. To obtain a long axis view, rotate the transducer 90 degrees with the orientation marker pointed toward the patient's head. Sweep the transducer across the pelvis from left to right to evaluate the pelvis for free fluid. A linear array transducer is used to evaluate lung sliding as an extension of the FAST exam. The orientation marker is positioned in the direction of the patient's head. The transducer is placed in a long axis orientation over the anterior chest wall at the third or fourth intercostal space in the anterior axillary to mid-clavicular line. The ribs are identified in the near field of the image as a bright interface with a posterior shadow. The pleural line is identified as a bright hyperechoic line between the rib shadows. The to and fro sliding movement of the visceral pleural against the parietal pleural with breathing generates the lung sliding sign.